bike brakes. They give riders control, confidence, and safety. But guess what else they are? The most confusing part of the bicycle, which in itself is confusing because they're so important. For many of us, the mystery begins with our first bike experience, trying to stop by dragging our feet on the ground. Then we're using our feet by pedaling backwards. Then we're using our hands, left for the front brake, right for the rear. I don't think so. If you're in England, it's left hand for the back brake. Now look at all of these variables. There's brake type, riding conditions, rider weight, hand size, hand strength, finger length, riding style, rotor temperature, air temperature, pad wear, pad compound, fluid temperature, pad temperature. I can't keep up. It's confusing and overwhelming. With so many variables, many riders don't know whether they have the right brakes or even where to begin. But that's why we're here, to start the demystification process with a little help from the science. It is extremely true that the brakes are such a huge part of the bike and it is such a, a starting point. Uh, and it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what category it is. We design a bike for an intended rider. It has an intended purpose. It has somebody that you're after, but you don't know if that's actually how they're riding. It's like, what kind of terrain are you riding? How long are you gonna ride there? You're gonna go ride in the mud in the winter, whether or not they have their levers inboard 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters. Okay. He knows what he's talking about, but he's getting into brake setup. And while setup is crucial, that's episode two. This is about understanding the right brake system with the right specs for where you ride and how you ride. But first, there's a few main factors that influence any brake's performance, no matter its features. Oh yeah, and for the record, we're just talking about hydraulic disc brakes here. Sure, there are still other brake types out there, such as mechanical discs and rim brakes, but they're increasingly rare. Hydraulic disc brakes are the undisputed champion. To understand the basics of the hydraulic system, when a rider pulls the brake lever, it pushes brake fluid through the line to a number of pistons in the caliper. That pushes the pads against the rotor. That's right. <laughs> High tech. So in selecting a brake for your bike, depending on the kind of riding you're gonna do, you might think about how fast you ride, how steep the terrain is that you ride, um, things like how aggressively you ride, and how frequently you wanna maintain your bike. Truthfully answering these questions will help you determine your optimal setup. Mountain bikers debate pretty much everything, and the fluid that goes in their brakes is one of those debates. Yeah. So in pretty much every brake on the planet, you'll find dot fluid, but then also in bicycle disc brakes, you'll find mineral oil. Beyond simple tests, like comparing the boiling points of each fluid, which are almost identical, it's been impossible to compare because no one's done it scientifically. But recently, one brand wanted to definitively know the differences and engineered two versions of exactly the same brake system to run on mineral oil or dot fluid. They remove from the equation the variables of caliper and lever design, allowing them to compare fluid types on a level playing field for the first time, apples to apples. And this is what they found. With mineral oil, you can basically, basically leave it for long periods of time with little or no maintenance, and it's not really going to change. As the saying goes, and the science shows, oil and water just don't mix. The lower maintenance of a mineral oil brake is optimal for people who don't ride in a competitive context or whose bike goes long periods of time without getting ridden. With dot fluid, you're getting the broadest band performance across range of temperature. So if you charge hard and do a lot of steep riding and you're looking to go as fast as possible, then you know, dot's gonna be your choice. Dot fluid brakes require higher maintenance because the fluid absorbs water over time. So in order to 
restore the performance to its peak, you're gonna have to periodically change the fluid. When we set out to make a mineral oil break, instead of only just changing the fluid, we also had to change all of the seals throughout the break. And through a lot of extensive testing, discovered that the seals used in a mineral oil break are not quite as high performing as the seals that we can use in a dot break, especially in very cold and very high temperatures. When you pull the brakes, your caliper pistons are displaced out and make contact with the rotor. When you let go, those rubber seals that seal the pistons in the caliper are what pull the pistons back to their home position. So that rubber is basically acting as a spring. Rubber is a viscoelastic material, so the speed at which it moves is gonna change with temperature. The rubber compounds that are compatible with dot fluid offer better performance because they have a broader temperature operating window relative to mineral oil compatible rubbers. For those of us who don't understand the material properties of mineral oil brake seals, we caught up with pro athlete Johan Borelli for a different perspective. Oh yeah. Well, what's often missed when talking about brakes and temperature, it's the seal material and its ability to manage heat. Take the drain plug sealing my bath, for example. If it was made of the all proof seal material required in mineral oil brakes, and there was a heat source near it capable of reaching temperature of 500 degrees, just like rotors and pad can heat, it could cause the bath plug to lose its squeeze, start to melt, and ultimately leak. And that's definitely not good. Wait, are you saying that the difference in which brake fluid performs best comes down to the seal material required? Yeah, that's the science. And speaking of science, mineral oil sounds like something you take a bath in, but it's not safe to touch your skin, or safe for the fish on the other side of his drain. It's a chemical, and it needs to be treated like one, just like dot fluid. That is some interesting science. Lots of riders believe the inconsistent bite point at the lever is a result of reaching a brake fluid's boiling point. With mineral oil brakes, it all comes down to the performance of the seal rubber. Demystifying brakes also requires consideration of piston count at the caliper. Larger diameter pistons have more surface area to press the pad against the rotor. A bigger pad means more of the pad material is responsible for creating all of that good friction. To explore this further, we got in touch with the folks at Enduro MTB, who run the Garda test, a lab test designed to push brakes to the brink of performance. When we do testing in a laboratory uh, for, let's say, a brake group test, of course, we have certain protocols with expertise from us, but we always reach out to different brands, different brake engineers to have the lab data ready when we are testing on the field. But the important thing is that those test riders, they don't have the data. But once we discuss the products, we have the data available and can validate certain things or the amount of pistons, the pad material, the rotor size, they definitely can be a really good indicator on the character of the brake. Rotors directly impact the amount of friction a brake caliper is able to create between the pads and the rotor. The more friction, the more stopping power. And a larger rotor both adds mechanical advantage because of a larger brake surface area and the ability to keep brakes running at their right temperature. Rotor size is another one that we go round and round on and, and how to pair it to that, that intent of the bike. I mean, take the SB130. We spec 180s on that because we feel like that's a good all around, all mountain bike. But then we kind of expand it to the SB130 lunch ride kit where, where we are specking bigger tires, bigger rotors, um, bigger brakes even. And that bike is meant to be pushed even harder compared to the standard SB130 spec. And if you look at the difference between a 180 rotor to a 200, it's about a 14% difference in stopping power. Imagine 14% less arm pump or being able to stop in 14% shorter distance. That could mean making the turn or not. While we can generally say that bigger rotors bring more control, that's actually not always the case. So a rider is running large rotors, but isn't braking hard enough, often enough, or long enough, or maybe isn't heavy enough to create enough friction to build up the right amount of heat in the pad rotor interface. 
Well, that's the key. As the temperature of a brake pad increases, so does the amount of friction it can produce. That means a rotor that's running too cool isn't going to heat up the brake pad enough to reach its full power. In this case, a smaller rotor can actually be more powerful. But there is a point where the temperature gets too hot and decreases the pad's ability to create friction. In this case, a bigger rotor can help. Either way, though, the right size rotor is critical. People always talk about power because it's a fascinating thing, but as important as the power is its control. The most natural thing for a brake is to produce heat. Why? Because friction causes heat. That's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Hate's definitely not the enemy. You need, you need hate. If you don't have hate, it's not going to work. How do you know? Well, it turns out that paying attention to the color of your rotors can help you know a lot. If you have brown markings on, on the spokes of your brake, that generally means that the brake is dissipating heat down the spoke like it's intended to do. If you have a purple or, or a rainbow kind of tinge down the spokes or on the braking track, generally that means that your brake is getting too hot. So in that instance, you could, you know, try changing pad compounds. You could try going up in rotor size, or sometimes they do cook and, and that's part of maintaining a mountain bike, basically. Whatever it takes to take the mystery out of brakes is worth it, because they're too important for us to continue relying solely on hearsay, opinion, and guesswork. Better brakes make better riders, no question. I literally couldn't race as fast as I do or have as much fun as I do unless my brakes are set up perfectly. My mechanic, he gets sick of me. Okay, that's a good point. That is a good point.